Welcome to Lesson 12F, Superposition in Potential Flow. In this lesson, we explain superposition and how we apply it to potential flow. We'll define some building block flows that we can superpose, and we'll do an example problem. First, let's review the equations for potential flow. These come from a previous lesson where we defined the velocity potential function, and we have the Laplace equation for both phi and psi. We also have the most beloved Bernoulli equation. And here we split these equations up into coordinates. Now let's talk about superposition. If a differential equation is linear, we can add up solutions, and the sum will also be a solution. This process is called superposition. Here are our two equations for phi and psi. These are both linear differential equations. Therefore, we can superpose solutions of phi and solutions of psi. Here's how it works. If phi 1 is a solution and phi 2 is a solution, then phi 3, which we define as c1 phi 1 plus c2 phi 2, where c1 and c2 are just constants, is also a solution. This is superposition. The same thing holds with stream function psi, since the differential equation for psi is also linear. That is, if psi 1 is a solution and psi 2 is a solution, the superposed psi 3 is also a solution. This is useful because we can build up complex flows by superposing simpler flows. That is, we build up complex flows by superposition. I'll give two cautions here. The first one is that superposition works only in irrotational regions of flow, not for general flows. That's because the general Navier-Stokes equation is not linear. Terms like u del u del x or v del u del y are not linear. The second caution is that the Bernoulli equation is not linear due to the v squared term. So you cannot superpose or add up pressure. You can superpose velocity potentials and stream functions and velocities, since velocity comes from differentiating one of these. But to get pressure, you have to calculate the velocity and then get the magnitude squared and use the most beloved Bernoulli equation to find pressure. Now I'll define some elementary planar irritational flows, which I like to call building block flows. With these, we can build up or superpose other flows. The first and simplest one is a uniform stream with some magnitude v. So the velocity field is that u equal capital V equal constant and v equals zero. So u is del phi del x or del psi del y, and that has to equal v. And little v is del phi del y or negative del psi del x, and either of these has to equal zero from our velocity components. I'll pick one of these and integrate psi equal vy plus f of x. So del psi del x is f prime of x, but del psi del x has to equal zero, which we integrate and find that f of x is a constant. Therefore, psi equal vy plus a constant. You can do a similar analysis with phi, and we get phi equal vx plus a constant. These constants are arbitrary. We usually set them to zero, but there are cases where we won't want to do that. In all these flows, I'll plot the streamlines as solid blue lines, and the lines of constant phi as dashed red lines. These are called equipotential lines, or actually curves, which are lines of constant phi. The streamlines, as you know, are lines or curves of constant psi. Notice that these intersect at right angles everywhere. This is called the principle of mutual orthogonality. That is, streamlines and equipotential lines always intersect at right angles. This turns out to be true for any potential flow. Now let's consider another building block flow namely a line source, or sink if the flow goes the opposite way. If our line source is at the origin, there's a line along the z-axis from which fluid spews out in all directions. So the streamlines are rays emanating from the origin, and the equipotential lines, in order to meet at 90 degree angles, are circles. We'll let v dot over l be the line source strength, where v dot is the total volume flow rate, and L is the depth into the page. So this line source strength is the volume flow rate per unit depth. From conservation of mass, we can show that UR has to be V dot over L over 2 pi R. This ensures that the same mass flow crosses any circle, and there's no tangential flow. So this is our velocity field, now in cylindrical coordinates. Note that there's a singularity point at the origin, but as long as we stay away from that singularity, this line source is still a useful building block. You can do similar algebra to what we did with 
phi and psi for the uniform stream. And you could show that phi equal v dot over l divided by 2 pi times the natural log of r. And psi is v dot over l over 2 pi times theta. I've left out the arbitrary constants. The equations for a line sink are identical, except that v dot is less than 0. What about if we have a line source at some point x, y equal a, b? I'll sketch that here, where the x location is a and the y location is b. And suppose we're interested in calculating the flow at some point x, y, or r theta. To analyze the flow here, we have to shift the origin, defining some other theta, theta 1, from the source to our point, and r1 from the source to the point. This vertical distance is y minus b, and this horizontal distance is x minus a. A little trig gives us r1 and theta1 in terms of x, y, and a and b. And when we plug into these equations, we use r1 and theta1, since we've kind of shifted the origin of the source relative to our point. Thus we write phi equal v dot over l over 2 pi natural log of r1, and psi equal v dot over l over 2 pi theta1. Plugging in our r1 and theta1, we get expressions for phi and psi. These are the equations for a line sink at x, y equal a, b. Our third building block is called a line vortex. There's no radial flow, and we'll let u theta equal gamma over 2 pi r. In this flow, u theta is decaying like 1 over r. It goes to infinity at the origin, so we have a singularity here as well. Gamma is called the circulation, and this is the strength of our line vortex. Again, we use these velocity components to calculate phi and psi. We know that u theta is 1 over r del phi del theta, and that's given from here. We multiply by r and integrate with respect to theta, adding a function of the other variable. But u r is del phi del r, which is 0. But from our equation, del phi del r equals 0 plus f prime of r. Setting this to 0, we integrate and get that f r is just a constant. Therefore, phi is gamma over 2 pi times theta plus a constant, which is arbitrary, so we set it to 0. Similarly, psi is negative gamma over 2 pi times natural log of r. So these are the equations for a line vortex of strength gamma. If gamma is greater than 0, we have counterclockwise flow, which is mathematically positive. And if gamma is less than 0, the flow is clockwise, or mathematically negative. We can see that curves of constant psi are curves where r equal a constant, or circles. And curves of constant phi are curves of theta equal constant, and these are just rays. So I can sketch equipotential lines and streamlines as follows. Streamlines are just circles centered around the origin, and equipotential lines are rays emanating from the origin. Again, they intersect mutually orthogonally everywhere. The astute viewer may realize that this line vortex is very similar to the source, except that the equipotential lines and the streamlines are opposite. For the source, the rays were the streamlines, and the circles were the equipotential lines. This is also seen in the equations. These equations for a line vortex are quite similar to those we had for a source, except the equations for phi and psi are kind of backwards here for the source compared to the line vortex. These equations are for a line vortex at the origin. At some other location, a, b, we do a similar shift in origin as we did with the source, and we get these equations, which again are very similar to the previous ones for a source, but the psi and the phi are switched. And there's also a negative sign because of the definition of psi. Our final building block is called a doublet. This is where we put a source and a sink of equal strength with the source on the negative x-axis and the sink on the positive x-axis, both at distance a from the origin. The source strength is v dot over l, and the sink strength is negative v dot over l. To get the doublet, we now let a go to 0 and v dot over l go to infinity simultaneously, such that the product a v dot over l is a constant. This will be the definition of a doublet. Hopefully you can imagine this in your mind. We bring this source and sink together towards the origin, while at the same time making them stronger. And in the limit, the source is at 0 minus, and the sink is at 0 plus, some infinitesimal distance apart. If they were exactly at 0, they would just cancel each other out. I'm not going to do all the algebra. You can look at our textbook where I derive all this. 
we define capital K as A over pi V dot over L, which we call the doublet strength. The doublet itself is an example of superposition. Since we're superposing a source and a sink, we get some relatively simple equations after all the algebra, namely phi equal k cosine theta over r and psi equal minus k sine theta over r. This is our doublet. This one's the most fun to draw. The streamlines end up being circles. Imagine the flow leaving the source to the left, circling around, and then getting drawn into the sink on the right. Other streamlines are also circles, but they're not concentric. They're circles that are tangent to the x-axis. And below the x-axis, there are mirror images. What about the equipotential lines? Well, they turn out to also be circles, but they're circles tangent to the y-axis. And they're also symmetric, this time about the y-axis. If you draw this accurately, you'll find that these are mutually orthogonal everywhere they intersect. This is the coolest of our flows, and it's called a doublet. Finally, I'll do an example problem. We have a potential flow that consists of a line vortex at 0b and a line source at 0, negative b. We want to calculate the velocity vector and its magnitude at the origin. I make a sketch. The line vortex is here at x equals 0 and y equals b, and the source is down here at x equals 0 and y equals minus b, and we're interested in what's going on at the origin. Qualitatively, the vortex causes a velocity to the right at the origin, and the source causes a velocity up at the origin, and the resultant vector sum of these is v. Now we use our equations to find this. u is just u theta here, and the radius from the vortex to our point is b, so u is gamma over 2 pi b. For the line source, v is ur, and the radius is also b, here from the source to our point of interest. There's only a vertical component, and v turns out to be v dot over l 2 pi b. For the line vortex, v is 0 in this problem, and for the line source, u is 0 in this problem, as we indicated here. As I mentioned previously, we can superpose velocities. Therefore, v total at the origin is a vector that consists of all the u components, u total, plus all the v components, v total. Well, this is gamma over 2 pi b from here, and there's no u component here. And v total is v from here and 0 from here. So this is our answer for v vector total. The components are just u equal gamma over 2 pi b and v equal v dot over l over 2 pi b. The magnitude of the velocity is the square root of u squared plus v squared. And we plug in these two values to get capital V. If we knew the pressure somewhere in the flow, we could use the most beloved Bernoulli equation to calculate the pressure at our origin. But remember that you can't just add pressures. They don't superpose. What you would have to do is calculate v squared and plug that into the Bernoulli equation. In the next lesson, we'll show some other examples of superposition. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.